Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Donna Weinstein. I'm Associate Dean for Graduate Education here in the College of Engineering at Purdue. Um, and it's my pleasure to, uh, to open up this Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series uh, talk. So uh, the uh, beginning in 2018, the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series invites world-renowned faculty and professionals uh, to Purdue Engineering to encourage thought-provoking ideas and conversations with faculty and students uh, regarding grand challenges and opportunities in their fields. Besides presenting a lecture to a broad audience of our academic community, I see across multiple levels here today, uh, they also engage in an interactive panel with Purdue faculty and students. Uh, to welcome our esteemed distinguished lecturer today, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Bill Crossley uh, to this stage. Professor Crossley is a professor and uh, J. William Urig and Anastasia Vornas, head of aeronautics and astronautics here at Purdue. He's been a faculty member since 1995. Uh, he's also the director for the Partnership to Enhance General Aviation Safety, Accessibility, and Sustainability, or PEGASIS, the FAA's Center for Excellence uh, for General Aviation. So please help me welcome uh, Dr. Crossley to the stage. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Donna. And, and again, as she said, I am the J. William Urig Anastasia Vornas, Head of Aeronautics and Astronautics. I'm really pleased you're joining us for the Petals Lecture today. So my job now is to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. R. John Hansman. I've known John for probably 20 years, although we were joking that maybe I started at Purdue when I was 12, so we're trying to figure that one out. Um, John's got a, a great resume here. I'm gonna to try to do it quickly, because he said you should cut it down short, but he's done so many neat things. He's the T. Wilson Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT where he's the director for the MIT International Center for Air Transportation. He conducts research in advanced technologies for air operational aerospace and transportation. He has seven patents, has written over 300 technical publications. He's got over 6,500 hours as pilot in command in airplanes, helicopters, and sailplanes, including meteorological production and engineering flight test experience. So he's got some stick time in addition to his lecture time. Uh, Professor Hansman also chairs the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration Research, Engineering, and Development Advisory Committee. Most of us know that as the REDAC, which is a really important uh, function, supports the FAA. He's also the co-director for the National Center of Excellence in Aviation Sustainability, which is known as ASCENT. He's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. He's a fellow of AIAA. He's received numerous awards, including the AIAA Dryden Lectureship in Aeronautics, the Wright FAA Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award, the ATCA, which is the Air, Trans uh, Air Traffic Controllers Association, Kritsky Air Traffic Award, a Laurel from Aviation Week and Space Technology, and the FAA Excellence in Aviation Award. So I can think of nobody better to give us some insights about electric and more automated aircraft. So please welcome John Hansman. All right, uh, thanks everybody. So um, I'm gonna talk about electric and electrification automation, but I wanna start off and use this as sort of a theme but how to think about innovation in general, but particularly in aeronautics. So there's sort of two ways to look at it. One is you, you're gonna innovate because you have some new opportunity due to a technology push. There's new technology, there's something that you can do that you can't do. <clears throat> um, and this could be for transport airplanes or helicopters or uh, general aviation airplanes. <clears throat> the other is you have a needs pull. So there's something that you need and you need to innovate to fix a problem, okay? So traditionally, um, <clears throat> a lot of our work early in my career was trying to sa work safety problems, okay? Um, so anything you could do to improve safety, you would do. There, there was a lot of push on research and a lot of, <clears throat> so anytime there was an accident, you would be trying to understand the reason for the accident and do that. Now, the good news, okay, is the air transportation system right now is incredibly safe. There's actually no other mode of transportation that's even close. Riding on an escalator is much more dangerous. Like we have an accident about commercial aviation about 0.2 per million departures. So it's, it's incredibly safe. <clears throat> now that's a good thing. It actually makes it hard to innovate, okay? Because I, I can't screw up the system. So if I do something new, I have to make sure I don't screw it up. And it's actually very hard to prove that you're not gonna screw it up. So, th so that's where sort of certification challenges come in. <clears throat> there are other needs pull and the one that's Big right now is sustainability. So 
Um, and I'll get to talk about that more. But there are also things like, what is the demand? Are there ways to scale the system? And again, are there new markets you can treat? So let me start by talking about the, the technology push in, in, uh, in terms of electrification and automation. Okay. So <clears throat> there, there's a lot happening in electric vehicles. If you see that picture in the lower right, there's all kinds of startup companies that are doing all kinds of weird vehicles. I'll talk about some of them. <clears throat> okay. There's also unmanned air vehicles that are showing up. Um, this is really driven by first electric electrification. You know, because of what we're seeing in the car market, because of the advances in batteries, um, there's interest in electric vehicles, particularly because they potentially have lower emission, and they enable uh, something I'll call distributed electric propulsion. I'll get into that. Uh, we also have lightweight and powerful control systems. Um, the sensors and the, and the processors and the algorithms. You know, if I look at my phone, okay, I have much more processing power in the phone than the Apollo capsule had or anything even close, okay? Um, and not only is it the processing, but it's the cameras, it's the sensors, it's the GPS and whatever. So this stuff is really small, really light, it really changes things. There's also advanced geometries that are enabled by materials, composite materials, um, ways to do very precise CNC molds, 3D printing, things like that. And finally, a lot of things that some people both here and we're doing at MIT are using sort of integrated design techniques that allow you to design the vehicle to be really, the overall vehicle to be really integrated, <clears throat> okay? So let me, let me start with this, okay? If you think about the quad rotors, okay? How many people here have flown a, flown a quad rotor? Okay, many people, right? It's a commercial product, okay? That's an existence proof of what you could do, okay? And, and these things are actually amazing, okay? They'll fly pretty long. They're incredibly precise, stable. You think about the pictures we use from these things. You know, 30 years ago, this would be, uh, you know, unthinkable in terms of this technology, okay? So, so people were doing this. We had a lot going on in, on UAVs. And people said, well, well, let's just scale it up, okay? Right? I just put a person on, on the thing. Okay, now, by the way, remember, uh, I'm sorry. Um, the safety thing here, <clears throat> the quad rotor has quad rotor. What happens when one rotor goes out in a quad rotor? You lose the vehicle, you crash. Okay, so we can't do that. So <clears throat> even on this, and this was the early Volocopter, okay, you, you just scaled it up. It's basically a quad rotor. It has more than, uh, more than four uh, rotors, so it's a multi-rotor. <clears throat> you can say it's got a sophisticated landing gear system and things like that. Um, so that was there. But this was actually the prototype of what became a company, okay, in Volocopter, this is one of the vehicles that's, <clears throat> that people are pushing in terms of this distributed electric propulsion. So just a scale up of the multi-rotor. And, and by the way, Volocopter is not the only one. Um, there's a Kitty Hawk flyer. I don't know if anybody's ever seen a picture of this. Same idea. This was actually funded <clears throat> by um, uh, Paul Allen, okay, from Google. It's sort of a startup with Sebastian Thrun um, out, out of Stanford. <clears throat> and, you know, if, if you look at it, it's interesting. Now, the, the lower left picture was the initial prototype, okay? Pretty sketchy. It kind of fails that safety case, right? Uh, by the way, you're, you're given an exemption on the safety side if you're an experimental aircraft or if you're very small, less than 254 pounds empty. <clears throat> so um, these guys sort of were flying under that uh, kind of ex safety exemption case. It was very sketchy. You'll notice some pictures of these. They're never over anywhere except water. Okay, right, <clears throat> and then the, the uh, picture in the center is a, a more modern version. So this was gonna be a product. They sort of decided it was too sketchy, it's not gonna happen. Um, the Chinese got in here, so they're Ehang, same idea, which is you have a multi-rotor system. Uh, these are being flown with two passengers <clears throat> um, uh, that, that in the vehicle, so, so, so they're there. Uh, I'll get back to it, one of the problems with the, with the uh, multi-rotor systems that are particularly the battery only one is they don't fly very long, okay? So there's problems with the battery technology, so you can't get a lot of endurance for them, but they're, they're, they're sort of good for very short missions. Um, but that's stimulated, and there's been a huge expansion of different vehicle architectures. This is the way so we decomposed it. Uh, you can think of it in terms of systems that have a few propulsors and others that have many propulsors or motors. <clears throat> and then there's rotor lift, um, there's actuating hybrid lift, which is basically tilt rotors. 
There's a static hybrid lift where you basically have a lift plus crew. So you have wings, okay, but you, you, you sort of take off vertically. I'll show you some more. And then there's conventional takeoff and land, and I'll get into some examples of that. So let me start with a lift plus cruise. Um, this was also started very early. If you, um, back, uh, again, Paul Allen, who actually was sort of the center of some of this initial starting. So the Silicon uh, Valley um, money sort of went into starting this business. <clears throat> um, he funded uh, Alon Crow from Stanford, uh, the stealth company, which was called Zero, And that's the patent out of Zero. And that's the lift plus crew. So the idea here is you have one set of motors that lift the airplane off the ground, and then you have a pusher or some other propeller to get you going forward till you get on the wing, um, and then you sort of fly on the wing. Um, Zero actually went into Kitty Hawk, so they were, Paul merged Kitty Hawk into the Cora, which is in the lower left. And now uh, Kitty Hawk has combined with Boeing into a company called Whisk. So that's the Whisk airplane there. Um, it's a pretty sophisticated design. Um, it's two passengers, and I'll come back to it, and it's fully, fully automated. Okay, with two passengers, they didn't want to, you can't um, afford the weight of the pilot, so you basically um, just stick with the two passengers. Uh, we'll get into those challenges. <clears throat> uh, there are other versions of this. This is the Beta uh, airplane. Um, oh, actually, let me go back to s some features. On this, um, on the Boeing Whisk, if you look at it, the motors are actually very clever. They're pancake motors that have low drag. When you start going forward, you don't want a lot of drag on the motors. Um, so, so they're very sort of thin motors with low drag. Um, you also, you'll notice you actually have 12 rotors on this vehicle, okay, because you have to deal, you still have to be able to fly the vehicle when you have an engine out condition. Um, the Beta Aaliyah is an interesting airplane. So, <clears throat> so this is showing here, this is a company in, uh, in Vermont, similar idea, lift plus cruise. Uh, you can see a picture of it on the left. You can see a picture on the right in flight, forward flight. <clears throat> okay, if you look carefully, you'll notice there are no rotors on it. Okay, so they're having trouble with the motors. Okay, you'll notice they only have four motors. The way they get their redundancy is each motor actually has multiple um, internal uh, coils on it. So even if you short out one motor, you still have propulsion on that side. So that's the way they have sort of are trying to do the safety case there. <clears throat> Another variant of this, this is the distributed electric propulsion um, uh, tilt lift, uh, is the Joby. Uh, vehicle. In the Joby vehicle, the propellers basically, or the thrusters lift you, and then once you get in the air, they start to tilt forward, and as, as, as you accelerate, they tilt more and more forward. So you can see it on the left in the climbing condition, and on the right, you can see it in the forward flight transition. Let me say all of these vehicles are very difficult to fly during the transition. So transitioning from the, the static to the forward is tricky from a from a flight control standpoint. <clears throat> There's some other, I like this one. There's another cute one. This is one of the small, sketchy, uh, high-risk ones called the Opener Black Fly. So this has got eight motors. It literally will pop off the ground, okay, uh, like a can opener and, and sort of fly around. Um, it's, <clears throat> uh, it's in the ultralight category, so it's, a, again, a single-person airplane. Um, then there's uh, another variant of this is, is the Archer Midnight. It, this is. This is a mix of the tilt rotors, which you can see in the front, and then just the lift motors, which are on the back, okay? Uh, so there are different uh, variations here. And, and finally, in this sort of category <clears throat> is the Lilium quote jet. It's really not a jet. It's just a bunch of small electric motors that are ducted. This is a German design. Um, and uh, interestingly, there, there's a lot of pictures of it in hover. I'm not sure they've flown in forward flight yet, so, yeah, but... Um, there's a picture of what it would look like in forward flight. Um, and there's another approach to this. Actually, uh, <clears throat> we were involved in it looking at the technical challenges and asked the question and got involved in something saying, well, what if you took the same technology, instead of trying to lift up and do vertical takeoff and land, what if you tried to take off and land in a really short uh, distance? And so um, th there's a company called Electra, which is doing a blown lift hybrid electric. And, and basically, we can, on a fairly large airplane, take off and land in about 100 feet. Um, the way we do this is with blown lift technology. So um, the, the idea here is if you blow <clears throat> over the wing with a deflected flap, you get some lift from the deflection of the flap, and you get a delay in the stall speed. So you can get very high lift coefficients. 
lift coefficients like six or seven or eight, okay, um, which allows you to fly incredibly slowly. Okay, now this idea has been around for a while. In the 70s, NASA in, <clears throat> in Europe, they did tests of airplanes with blown lift, but they were me mechanical propulsion systems which were very complicated. Um, the, the distributed electric propulsion is a really elegant application of this because it's very easy for me to now put my motors along the leading edge of the wing. And this is much more like a conventional airplane. So we got involved in it in, a, in student design projects, <clears throat> um, did some initial feasibility studies, uh, did a four passenger concept design. We then did wind tunnel testing of the blown lift capability and the students designed and built a 30% scale demonstrator. And this technology was then handed off to a startup company, Electra, which is building uh, the airplane. So this, this is an Electra slide. You can see them <coughs> uh, pointing to the MIT uh, tests. And we're building right now a two-passenger technology demonstrator. This is now not battery-powered. It's hybrid electric. I'll get into that in a minute. Um, <coughs> but it's got four motors on each side. The test airplane is based on a Cessna 172 wing. Uh, with a bespoke fuselage in the propulsion system. And then there's a product. This will be flying ne next summer or spring, and I'm sort of lined up to be the test pilot on the airplane, so I've been spending a lot of time making sure they don't screw it up. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so, so, so that's kind of the technology push. L let me now switch to the needs pull and go in a different direction. The, the biggest thing that's going on in the overall aerospace industry, if you talk to the people of Boeing or Airbus or whatever is concerned about sustainability, Okay, this is an existential threat to air transportation. So the, there's, you know, huge focus on environmental impacts, primarily climate change and, global, and carbon emission and global warming, although there's, there's concern with other emittents. The first thing to note, though, is that basically emissions scale with fuel burn. So anything you do to improve fuel efficiency will improve the sustainability of the airplane. Okay, um, so this increased focus on greenhouse gas emissions <clears throat> Is, is really, as I said, an existential threat. Um, aviation today represents between two and three percent of the man-made or anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. However, as we move to other electrification in, in industry and in cars and whatever, the percentage attributed to aviation is gonna increase. So there is a real concern about flight shaming and, and the, basically the degradation of the market. So the industry is trying to figure out how to how to close the gap. <clears throat> now, one thing to note, remember I said that the, 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 um, the emissions scale with, with fuel burn. Okay, where, does the, where is the fuel consumed? So this is a plot from Brian Yuko, who's the chief engineer for sustainability in one of my former students at Boeing. <clears throat> this is, actually comes from his thesis. Is, this is a plot of the w flights around the world, okay? The green is the, is the number of departures that, um, is a function, a function of stage length. And the blue is the fuel consumption, okay? And what you see is that 50% um, that <clears throat> of the departures, okay, are, are I don't know the right way to say it, because I, I think about this somewhat uh, differently, but basically the story of this, this plot is that most of the fuel is burned on long haul propulsion, okay? So, you know, 50% of the fuel is consumed by flights greater than 2,800 kilometers. Whereas, um, you know, 50% of the, where that's 90%, only, sorry, only 12% of the flights, okay? Um, so the idea here is if you really want to make a difference, you want to work on the long haul. Um, that's, by the way, the hardest technically to solve. So this is the challenge for, for all of us. Um, okay, so there's many different approaches to this, to sustainability. This is where the electric comes back in. Uh, battery electric, hybrid, ele hybrid electric, hydrogen, and then there are things you can do in conventional. Battery electric sounds really good, okay? There's zero emissions. By the way, that's only if you get your energy from a clean grid. <clears throat> Most of our grids are not that clean, okay? But in the future, we'll have cleaner grids. And the, as I told you in the beginning here, electric allows you to do all this distributed electric propulsion stuff. So there's all kinds of interesting things you can do. However, you're really limited on what you can do, particularly in the range payload, <clears throat> okay? Uh, we'll get to that. There's also safety uh, and certification issues and a, a bu bunch of detailed issues. Let me, let me get to the battery issue. Okay, so the, here's, the, here's the problem. Batteries sound good, but they're not very energy dense, okay? If you think about jet fuel, 
okay? It's got 11,000 or about 12,000 watt hours per kilogram of fuel, okay? If you think about batteries, the best batteries are about 400 watt hours per kilogram, okay? So you're paying a huge hit on, on weight, okay? <clears throat> and then, by the way, you can't get the you can't get the energy density from this. This is at the cell level. When you start actually looking at how you would use it, you get what we call knockdown factors, okay? So you need to take those cells and you need to pack them in something so if they catch fire, they don't catch the other cells on fire, okay? So you lose about 25% there, okay? You actually don't know how much energy you have in the cells, okay? Everybody, anybody ever had their computer run out of energy? Or do you know how, exactly how long it's gonna be before your computer runs out? You have no idea, right? Okay, so you got to deal with that, okay? Um, then as the computer gets older, it gets worse. <clears throat> and then, by the way, it, for airplanes, you, you can't run out of energy in the air in your distributed electric propulsion airplane or you're in a brick, right? Okay, so you got to be on the ground. So you've got to have margin, okay, uh, which we consider to be reserves. So really only about 25% of, of that energy is available for the mission. So it really limits what you can do, okay? So there are many people doing battery airplanes, if you go look at the market. So what I've got here are some examples. And by the way, this is my, this is Hansman's scorecard on, on real, the reality check is the color, okay? So if you go to that whisk airplane I told you about, that's a two-passenger airplane. They're talking about missions of 25 miles. That's probably doable, okay? Joby, they've got a five-passenger airplane at 150 miles. Questionable, okay? Lilium, seven passengers at 155 miles. Really questionable, okay. Um, Regent, I didn't talk about Regent. Regent is interesting. This is actually using the battery technology but for a wing and ground effect seaplane that takes off on hydrofoils. That, uh, they're talking 180 miles, 12 passengers. That's probably doable. That's uh, green to yellow. Um, and then there are people doing sort of retrofix into conventional airplanes, aviation and heart. If you look at their numbers, it's just hard to see how they're going to work, okay? So, th so they get the reds, okay? Um, <clears throat> the other thing is I mentioned the battery thermal runaway. Um, almost everybody who's worked in this space, okay, has had a fire on their... T this is the aviation prototype airplane that burned itself up, okay? So remember, you're not even allowed to carry your lithium-ion batteries on the airplane, okay? So now I'm going to carry them as, as the mission. Anyway, all right. Um, now, an alternative is to go to hybrid electric, okay? Um, and <clears throat> that has some advantages, so I still get all the con electric configuration advantages, but I can get better range and efficiency, <clears throat> okay? Um, and in fact, um, one of the nice things about a, um, a hybrid is that I can run the turbine, run the engine in its ideal operating point. So instead of, right now we design the airplanes for takeoff, the engines for takeoff, and so at cruise, there may not be at their optimal operating point. Here, you can run at your ideal operating point most of the time. So you get some advantage. Uh, you can use some of the sustainable fuels, so it's okay. Um, but it, it adds complexity and weight to the airplane, so it has to buy its way onto what you call buy its way onto the airplane. Um, there's some configurations. So Airbus is doing a, um, a, a fan demonstrator. Honda is looking at it for EV toll. And that electro airplane I told you about is designed to be um, hybrid electric, again, so that you could get the range and mission profile out of it. Um, uh, there's some other things you can do that people have been looked at for bigger airplanes. One of the things um, uh, you, you can do on <clears throat> the right is the NASA, is the double bubble that came out of MIT and Aurora, the left is the NASA Stark, is something called boundary layer ingestion. So you get, you get drag from the boundary layer that generates a turbulent boundary layer on the fuselage. Um, and the idea in boundary layer ingestion is if you, if you suck that, that boundary layer into the engines and accelerate it with the engines as a thrust, <clears throat> you, can, you can get a uh, uh, re significant reduction in the drag of the airplane. So that'll improve the efficiency. The problem in a, turbine, a typical engine is that the jet engines can't take the crappy flow that comes in from the turbulence. But with a hybrid electric, you might be able to get around that because the, the fans may not be as sensitive. The other problem, if you look at that double bubble uh, case, there's a concern on what's called engine fratricide. If both engines are next to each other and one of them blows up, it takes out the other engine, you lose the airplane. So there are some problems there. So, so there's some reasons why 
hybrid may allow some of these other capabilities that buy this way on. <clears throat> Let me also say a little bit about hydrogen. Um, hydrogen, in some cases, is part of an electrification, but also hydrogen and aircraft is effectively just a, a um, chemical battery. Okay, it's a way to take energy that you generate on the ground, put it in the airplane to use in the air. Okay, uh, and there are different configurations. So you can use hydrogen as a direct fuel into engines. Jet engines will burn almost anything. Uh, you can do a hydrogen hybrid where you have a turbine that, that does the battery, or you can do a hydrogen electric fuel cell. Okay, so the hydrogen goes into a fuel cell to generate electricity for the system. Now the challenge in hydrogen is how do you store it? Okay, the beauty of hydrogen is it has, it's, 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 a, it's a chemical that has actually a higher energy density than f jet fuel. The problem is its volumetric density is very poor. So it takes, or, uh, or volumetric energy density is very poor. So it re requires a lot of volume. You can, com you can basically compress the hydrogen down, okay, um, in, in a high pressure gas storage, which I'm showing on the right, <clears throat> okay. Um, it, and that will work, but now you have the weight of that compression. So with new technologies, maybe we can get that down. There's some work there. Or you can compress it into a cryogenic liquid, which is what's done on spacecraft, okay, or, or uh, space launch vehicles. Um, that's doable. It has a bunch of, however, operationally, it has all kinds of problems. And by the way, you now have hydrogen leaking around the system, which is not necessarily a good thing. Okay, so the pluses are it's zero emissions, if you, again, if you get it from a clean grid. Um, it's got a potential for long-range flight, but there's all, all these other problems I just sort of talked about. <clears throat> um, it also, by the way, requires a hydrogen fueling infrastructure. Okay, so if I have a hydrogen airplane, I have to only go to airports where I can refuel the airplane, which I have to think about. Okay, there are people doing it. There have been some demonstrations. Uh, upper left is DLR, has a fuel cell case. There's a company called Zero Avia that's, that's retrofitting fuel cells um, into <clears throat> um, 19 passenger uh, airplanes. Um, and there's a company um, called Universal Hydrogen uh, led by Paul Aramenko, who was the CTO at, uh, at uh, Airbus for a while, um, which is doing compressed hydrogen uh, retrofit. So, so there is action sort of going on in that space. And then there's some other cases here. Um, let, me, um, let me push over, over now to the automation focus, okay, uh, a little bit and say a few words about the automation. Uh, <clears throat> so the, um, the part of the reason why we want to automate is, is by both the needs pull, is from the needs pull. We'd like to scale the systems, um, and particularly some of these things that you saw like the uh, uh, the eVTOL airplanes, there are not enough pilots to fly those airplanes. So how do you allow the system to grow bigger or allow more people access to, to aviation, okay? So there, there's a lot uh, going on in autonomy, okay? Uh, currently crew costs, okay, um, are, are a major factor for an airline. Crew costs are about 25% of the direct operating costs of a, of a, a major airplane, airline. So, <clears throat> so you'd like to cut those costs of possible. You also notice if anybody here has been on a flight that's been delayed, we don't have enough pilots right now in the U.S. to fly all the flights that people want to fly. So we really are at a place where we're being hung up by that. Okay. Um, there's been a lot. If you, the lower left there is an Airbus cockpit. Okay. And it turns out in most transport category airplanes, we already automate the flights. Okay. T on typical uh, transport airplane, the pilots start the engines, they taxi out, they get it to the end of the runway, they take off, they climb to 500 feet, and they turn on the autopilot, fly the entire flight on the autopilot, get to the final, and on flare and landing, they take, take the autopilot off and, and land. Uh, the airplanes are technically capable of landing themselves under at certain airports and runways. So um, we're actually very good, just like we were with the quad rotor, on automating what the, the lower right is showing, kind of inner loop control tasks. What, what that, uh, that right picture is, is showing you the feedback loops. <clears throat> and what it shows you is that, you know, from a flight control system, we're pretty good. We can automate that stuff. The harder stuff comes in, and where the humans are doing it, in, um, are really more at sensing the environment, understanding the situation, okay, which we call situation assessment, and then changing this, the, the plan if there are different conditions there. Now, 
There is a question as to whether that has to occur on the airplane or whether it can occur off. So there's a lot of work going on in sort of looking at how to do that. Um, there's a project, this is kind of a joke, but there's a DARPA project called the Aircraft Labor and Cockpit Automation Alias that actually looked at, <clears throat> at that. Um, and, and there are programs, some, some people call simplified vehicle operations. The idea here is to not get rid of the cockpit, uh, not get rid of the pilot, but to basically simplify flying the airplane so more people can fly uh, more reliably. I, I'm, a, I'm a pilot, I, I actually fly it myself for, for transportation. I didn't fly out here, I should have, okay. But, um, <clears throat> um, the, but one of the challenges is in order to stay current to fly in all weather conditions, you know, I have to spend a lot of money and fly a lot of different airplanes just to be current and with that. It's actually not that hard to do, but that's sort of the way the rules work. So we're trying to look at can the technologies make it easier to stay um, current or, or reduce what is required to be able to use the airplane as, as an operator. Um, they're also the air for, there for some safety reasons. So this is actually the first certified full automation system on an airplane. It's called the Garmin Autoland system. There are a couple of airplanes where <clears throat> if the pilot becomes incapacitated on a single, uh, single pilot operation, a passenger or, um, can press a button that says emergency auto land. And the airplane will actually fully fly itself. It will actually declares over the radio that it's an emergency, that it's landing, and it will find an airport, and it will land, and it will get to the ground, OK? Um, and by the way, this is an interesting certification case, because it was hard to prove. Remember I told you you had to prove that you're, you're not going to degrade the safety in the system? It was hard to prove that there, this would work to the standards that would be accepted for very high level automation. However, the argument that the test pilots and Garmin made to the FAA is, hey, anybody who's pressing this button is gonna crash, right? I mean, the pilot's incapacitated, right? So the, so the downside was not that low. So they said, all right, we'll, we'll certify that one. Okay, all right. Um, but that's sort of motivated, there's a bunch of activity going on on this, okay? Um, so I mentioned again, I'm, I keep coming back to it, the Boeing Whisk airplane. This is gonna be fully autonomous out of the gate. Okay, so they're never planning to have a air pilot fly this airplane. It, you know, if you even look at it, there's no control stick. There's, there's nothing in there. You just fly it. Um, <clears throat> and, and part of the reason why Boeing is investing in this is they see this as a path to testing what needs to be done to really put humans in an airplane that would be fully, fully autonomous, okay? It's, it's easier to start with a two-person airplane than a 600-person airplane. Okay, so that's why they're starting small. Um, the, the two companies on the right, X-Wing and Reliable Robotics, <clears throat> are doing a similar thing, but they're not even putting people in there, they're starting with cargo, okay? So they're taking Cessna caravans and converting them over for, <clears throat> um, uh, to be uh, fully, quote, fully autonomous. I'll get back to a minute what I mean by fully autonomous, but no human on the airplane, okay? Um, and again, it's a little bit easier because if the bags crash, die, they don't die, right? So. Um, the, the one on the lower left is Skyrise. So they're automating a helicopter. This is an R66 helicopter. Uh, technically more challenging, but again, there's some things you can do with that um, that would be very useful. <clears throat> okay, um, one of the th things that you see, if you go back, so WISC, in addition to their airplane, has worked on what's called a CONOP. So this is, by the way, a very common thing in, in this industry is it's a concept of operation. So how it, what would happen if you really were to go and, and fly this airplane? So, and if th there's a document that they just published to, to get everybody on board, including the FAA, with how this is gonna work. Now the interesting thing, if you look at it in detail, is that they haven't gotten rid of the human, they've just moved the human off the airplane, okay? So the, 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 a lot of the stuff that I show here is the human role in today's cockpits, okay? has been moved off the airplane to the fleet operations center. So we have good communications. So when you get to a hard decision, like, you know, I mean, by the way, if you're an airline pilot, one of the hardest decisions is somebody is sick on the back of the airplane. Do you divert or don't, don't you? Okay, so these are things that are hard to write into a computer software algorithm, okay, right? So things like that, you sometimes need to call home for advice as to what you should do, all right? Um, all right. Let me go to my last example, and then we'll, we'll go to questions, okay? Which is, do
doing something totally new and important with the airplane, but also driven on sustainability. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that we did uh, started about three years ago um, with, uh, again, students at MIT in collaboration with Harvard and um, some schools in Portugal. Uh, we developed a, a high altitude, long endurance airplane system called the Stratospheric Airborne Climate Observatory System. So this was a, uh, a high altitude um, uh, solar airplane, uh, which would <coughs> was done to basically take measurements to support understanding of global climate change. Okay, so that was the mission. Um, there, there are a bunch of uh, missions in there, but let me, let me talk a little bit about these airplanes. So people have been trying to do high altitude, long endurance electric airplanes, for, uh, solar airplanes for a while. Okay, NASA did the Helios <coughs> um, airplane, which by the way crashed in 2003. Okay, by, um, there, you can see the airplane, it had a 247 foot span. Okay, right, the span was a football field. There's a Facebook Aquila <coughs> um, that has a span of 140 feet. That also crashed. So, so these airplanes, in order to basically get the wing area you need for the solar cells, okay, need to and, and to fly at these very high altitudes, need to be very, very, very light wing loading, okay. And they're basically these flexible structures that were very hard to put together. Um, by the way, also a lot of people in this industry, and uh, um, I do have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is Aurora. This is this is a 243 foot span airplane. Okay, all solar cells. Now, these airplanes were generally designed to be basically communication relay satellites. So they wanted to stay in one location and they wanted to operate all year, okay? And um, this, this airplane got shut down before it flew. <clears throat> it was built but didn't fly. So um, one of the things you realize is that this was really tough. Now, um, jumping back to the mission I was talking about, a lot of the climate change missions are driven by phenomena that occur during the summer. So wh what we did is we say, well, if we relax the constraint of operating all year <clears throat> and only operate during the summer, does the design become uh, more reasonable? The other thing is, in traditional, remember I talked to you about optimization tools. Traditionally, you op the, the, the criteria used for optimization is the weight of the airplane, because that's normally a surrogate for the cost and complexity. But we realized that the, the surrogate to optimize is actually the wingspan, because that's a surrogate here for risk. So we wanted to reduce the risk of the airplane. <clears throat> so, so what we did is we designed, uh, we optimized for wingspan, to cl and we didn't try to do it. We only looked for summer months. So the upper right plot is a plot of required wingspan to fly a particular mission, okay, as a function of latitude and time of the year. And what you see, which is not a surprise, is in the southern hemisphere, right, in, the, in <clears throat> their, their summer, if you go to the poles, right, uh, it gets easy. Now, by the way, I should have explained. The reason why it gets easier is you need batteries to get through the night, okay? But when you're, <clears throat> when you're at the, you know, uh, the peak summertime in the northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, at the pole, you have no night, so you don't need any batteries. Now, you don't quite get there. But, but the idea here is that you can make the airplane much smaller and lighter. So instead of, you know, 300 foot span airplanes, we're now talking 60 foot span airplanes, which are really reasonable. So we've designed that airplane, <clears throat> and it has a, a, a bunch of, it's a two motors. Uh, one of the other things is because the wings are so flexible, you can't use normal ailerons. Okay, so, so the way we do roll control is you can see these devices out there that we call tailerons, okay. Um, and what they do is they actually go the opposite sense. So, so you use the tailoron to intentionally twist the wing, and you get an increase in lift in the wing. So it's, it's, it's sort of a little bit counterintuitive. Um, and the first mission that we're, <coughs> we're planning on this or we're working up is a mission to the Antarctic. <coughs> um, so this is a, a collaboration with Brent Menchow from uh, uh, EECS which is um, the biggest uncertainty in global sea level rise has to do with how fast uh, ice will flow off the Antarctic glaciers. The, the, it turns out that these glaciers are being blocked by ice sheets that are on, on the face of the glaciers. And those ice sheets are breaking up. So there is a concern that they suddenly are gonna break away and you're gonna have a massive uh, increase in sea level rise. Um, and this is the, the biggest uncertainty. There is no way to go to the Antarctic and observe this in, in the resolution you need. 
We can do satellite observations, but they only update once a week. And for understanding the breakup, you really need to be there and watch cracks form in the ice. So the idea is to send this airplane down to the Antarctic to do that. So um, we've been doing development in it. And this summer, in collaboration with this company, Electra, there, we had student intern build the, the first prototype of the airplane. So this is the airframe that will fly in the stratosphere, OK? Um, this is the first flight that occurred in August. You can see the tailorons um, and, and the motors on the airplane. It was a quick build effort, so uh, it doesn't have the full set of solar cells, uh, et cetera. But <clears throat> this was the existence proof, and we're now getting support to uh, do, do the first stratospheric flights. And from the first stratospheric flights, then we'll go to the Antarctic. So um, let me stop there and open it up for questions and discussion. So I realize this is pretty broad, but I just want to hit lots of topics. So yeah. Oh, oh, I think we, we want to. Uh, first of all, let's give, let's give Dr. Hansman a hand. Thank you, John. Raise your hand, and either I or Marina will run around and hand you a microphone. So, right behind you. I was just curious um, when it comes to like cleaner ways of getting the plane off the ground, um, are ionic or nuclear propulsion like, considered at all for this? And if not, why? Okay. So, all right. So um, there are some people doing ionic propulsion, but the problem is there's not enough thrust from the ionic propulsion to get a big airplane off the ground. So it may work for some small UAVs and things like that, but I think it just isn't going to scale. By the way, the, the part of the problem is that in order to get the voltages high enough to get a lot of thrust in, in the atmosphere, it'll cause a breakdown, which is like what you have inside a fluorescent bulb. So that's the technical challenge there. Um, nuclear. Um, the, the, nobody's looking, as far as I know of, seriously at nuclear on the airplane. And the reason is, if you have an accident, you have a nuclear spill, it's, it's ugly, okay? There are, I do believe that we're going to see nuclear or, fu or, or um, fusion um, used to provide the energy that will either go into the batteries or the hydrogen or whatever. So I think the more likely path is uh, use the nuclear power to go into a chemical conversion that you can fly on the airplane, is my guess, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what do you think about the viability of solid state or graphene batteries and how they would affect um, the practicality of electrical propulsion? Yeah. Um, you know, like the battery space right now is cool. It's the Wild West. Okay. It, you know, I mean, the, the bottom line is, from the airplane standpoint, is uh, performance. So, first off, if you can get something that's not going to go into thermal runaway, I'm all for it. OK, right, so if, if you can get to it. Um, and Because that, that saves me on the packing factor. And then it's all about energy density, right? So right now, people are about 400, 450. The people are at, at the cell level, OK? Um, and you know, if you look at the trends, they're moving up, but I don't know how fast. So if there's some quantum transition, um, you could be there. But remember, we're 400. It's 12,000 on jet fuel. OK, so until you can do that transition to 12,000, you're there. So there's a big gap between where you are. So what will happen is the low end battery applications will become more ap applicable, but I don't think it's going to solve the, solve the problem. I think we got to, that's why hydrogen or, uh, and I didn't talk about sustainable fuels, that's another option, but there's, we're going to have to do something like that. Hey. OK, yeah. um, this question uh, may or may not be uh, for investment purposes. Um, but when it comes to air taxis, from what you've seen, um, do you think one company is better poised to take market share, or is it really a race to certification? Um, so uh, I think there's a bunch of, com you know, um, there is a race to certification. I think people totally underestimate how hard it's going to be to certify. The people who are probably in the best position right now are Whisk and Joby. OK, uh, Joby, their advantage is they're vertically integrated and they're partnered with Uber. So if they can get certified to carry passengers, they got a market. OK, I don't know whether they can make enough money in their market to pay for all the money they spent to do the development, but that's a, that's a business uh, question. Um, I think <clears throat> Whisk is another possibility because they're, they're pretty far. Those, so those are the two that are furthest along. Um, Whisk is probably harder because they have to certify without a pilot, where Joby is just trying to certify the airplane with a pilot. So I think there's, 
you know, if you had to handicap them, I think they would probably get there first, okay. Um, but there may be some other applications, like say, I'm, you know, I have a bias interest in the Electra. I think Electra, uh, on the certification side, Electra gets certified as an airplane, okay. And it's actually somewhat easier to certify as an airplane. Joby gets certified as this mishmash of, uh, of tilt rotor, uh, vertical lift, and airplane. So they're, they're actually, three days ago, or last week, they published the certification proposal in the Federal Register. So we don't actually, they don't even have a basis for certification. So it's, yeah, but we can get in a long discussion, but it's, it's tricky, so. Other question, yeo. Yeah. Um. I have a question. You mentioned thermal runaway, yeah. and um, I was wondering if uh, that is a limiting factor because I see a number of applications for this spacecraft, uh, this aircraft that you have designed. Yeah. Um, especially if you are trying to uh, monitor, say, desert regions or countries yeah. with yeah. arid climate. Yeah. Um, how would you imagine the impact of thermal runaway would constrain flights in those regions? Yeah. So it, it depends on whether it's a, it's a man, manned airplane or, or a human populated airplane or not, okay? For a UAV, unmanned uh, airplane, it's probably easier, I mean, we're already at pretty high thermal ener energy densities. You may have thermal runaway, it's terrible, but you know, the, the probability you'd, you'd hurt someone. Um, for human airplanes, airplanes with humans, you, you have to design for thermal runaway, okay? So if I have a cell that goes bad, I have to guarantee that that airplane will not crash. That's actually going to be a, a safety certification requirement. So that's the reason why the cells get to be problematic because I have to add weight to, the way I deal with that is I, I provide protection be, between that cell and the other ones and it just adds weight and the thing gets to be hard. So you're in this area. That's why, you know, if you can show up with the graphene batteries that will do the trick, it's going to make it much easier because I'm, I'm going to get around that problem, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, four electric aircraft and a hybrid electric, uh, hybrid electric aircraft and a hydrogen aircraft, yeah. like three different uh, configurations. Uh, which one you think is the uh, most uh, possible configuration that will uh, serve the pu uh, public transportation in the near future? So I think that um, uh, I, th I think that the hybrid electric is the most likely to to really be a practical airplane. Hybrid electric with sustainable aviation fuels is probably where you're gonna go for the midterm future. There, there, are, there are some battery airplanes will come in, but they'll come in only at the very short range. Okay, right? And then um, I think in 100 years we'll be flying hydrogen airplanes, okay? But, but there's, there's a lot to be done from there. And let me say there's some non-obvious things on hydrogen, okay? So on the on liquid hydrogen, which looks really good, okay, one of the problems is um, in, for safety reasons, at least if you do it the way we do it today, okay, uh, when I refuel a hydrogen, when I re, uh, refuel uh, a launch vehicle, okay, uh, one of the things I have to do is I have to make sure that I get the hydrogen out of there when I'm done, okay? So I have to purge the system, and I purge it um, with helium. And the reason why I have to use helium is helium is the only gas that won't freeze at um, uh, liquid hydrogen temperatures. So you really don't have any alternative, okay? There is not enough helium in the world to do that. So when we've done projections as to the cost of a hydrogen operation, liquid hydrogen, 50% of the cost would be the cost of the helium to purge the tanks, okay? So, so there's the non-intuitive factors that get into that. Now, we might be able to fix those technically, but those are challenges. So that's why they're, they're further out there, okay. Other question, yeah. Quick question. Of the four or five-ish eVTOL designs that you talked about, which one do you foresee being the most certifiable or most safe for the consumer market? The, you know, the compound helicopter, the hydrostatic, or the tilt rotor? Okay, like, I believe the, uh, the eStol, because that's the one I'm willing to be the test pilot on. Okay, right. <laughs> um, uh, of, of, the, of the other ones, you know, um, I, th I think they're, they could all get there. Okay, obviously the easiest one is the, um, is the multi-rotor system. Okay, the Volocopter's already flying. But if you looked at that, I mean, that thing had 18 rotors, okay? It's, 
it's not very efficient, okay? So sure, if you only want to hop across the river, that, that, so that, that'll, that'll work. Um, I think that the, uh, th then the, th like I say, the Whisk and the Joby configurations both are, are there. Um, it, it's hard to know the technical challenges are, are through transition. And by the way, one of the big problems in those airplanes I didn't talk about operationally is the noise. So um, we don't know yet. Everybody's pretty close to the vest on what their real performance is. So we'll have to see. So it'll shake out. It's going to be a very interesting time, right? There's a, I mean, that's why it's a cool time to be doing stuff because there's a lot happening. And the, the, the interesting thing from an airplane design standpoint is the electrification opens up the design space to configurations that, you know, we're totally ridiculous. Both a combination of the electrification and the flight control system. So I can use configurations that would never be realistic 30 years ago, so. Other questions? You kill them? Ah, oh, come on. There's one in the back. That's that side of the room, John. They, yeah. they like you over here. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm scaring everybody on this side of the room, I, I apparently. Don't, nobody wants to talk to the professor. Uh, hi. <laughs> so um, most of the presentation was geared towards like commercial applications of yep. these new technologies yep. and the pushes and pulls associated with that. Um, obviously, defense is a very yep. large portion of the aerospace industry. So how do you see like, the similarities and differences between these technologies in the defense sector, and what are some of the other pushes and pulls that might be present in one space versus the other? Yeah, for these type of airplanes, there's some, there's some interesting differences. So for example, um, one of the applications that I've seen is for some of these things, th that's a very useful eVTOL application is for medical evacuation. So you, you might have a unmanned, and, I, and you know, again, if you're somebody on the battlefield who's, who's critically wounded, you're willing to, you know, again, you're, the risk to get in a, a, a non-piloted vehicle and be a single person carrier out, you know, automated kind of makes sense. So I think you see some, some applications like that. Um, the, uh, you know, there's some applications on the stole stuff that uh, is being looked at. Um, there are, uh, you know, Joby is, is involved. There, there's a whole Air Force program uh, doing some of that uh, things. It, th those, they tend to be more special forces type missions and things like that where you're trying to fly people in and out um, or, or support on sort of, you know, distributed island situations and things like that. So there's definitely applications there. There's a whole nother set of, you, you know, discussion on autonomy and unmanned air vehicles for military applications that go into other areas that, you know, uh, that are there, but probably beyond the scope of what we can talk about here. So. Oh, yeah. Um, while partnering with Harvard and Portugal, how do you balance the ethics and promise of that possibly cutting-edge project? Uh, say a little bit more about the ethical concern. Um, ethical concerns, I guess, since it's the tech industry is becoming bigger and it could be used for other things besides what you yeah. meant it to be, and then... Also, it's, it, it's a very small sample size of what you've been able to do so far. Yeah, um, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, technology can always be used as a double-edged sword. I think that, um, particularly this class of vehicle that we're talking about here, it, it, um, has very limited sort of ad, adverse use. These, these tend to be used for things like surveillance missions and, and thing, things like that. So. Um, I, this, I would say it did not come up with, as a concern to us. I think our, our bigger concern on, on this area is, is trying to convince people to really get the information to understand climate change in a way that will support action. Okay, yeah. Yeah, sure. Do you think if you get a military contract with your project as it advances, yeah what is kind of the, the leeway between, like, do you give your project, part of your project to them, or do you kind of just keep it to yourself in the public sector instead of private? Um, I mean, it depends on the, I, I, I guess I'm not sure exactly the context. I mean, everything we've done so far is in public, is in the public sector. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. just saying I have, I have family members that are in special forces and also do autonomy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Aut autonomy. So, yeah. When you bring this very cut, possibly cut edge project, how do you, yeah. I guess, kind of make sure it's <laughs> ethically capped at one 
at one point so it doesn't get out of control when you possibly have a military contract. Yeah, I mean, I think th different individuals have different views of what, um, what the ethical concerns are. I think the, the question is if you believe that there's a need for sort of military support, you know, then, then there are people who will support the military. Um, you know, I, th I think my, for my, me personally, um, I'm comfortable with sort of surveillance and support stuff like the uh, Electrostol is supporting special operations, but is not a uh, is not a direct weapon source. So I mean, but indivi different individuals will have their own lines. Yes. Yeah. Question yeah. box. Yeah. Hey. You mentioned Garmin Autoland that will yep. just declare the emergency for in the case of an incapacitated yeah. pilot. Yeah. When that system is in place, for example, with a piloted aircraft that declares an emergency, one of the first things ATC wants to know is the intentions of that aircraft. Yeah. So is there the functionality for ATC to actually interface with the system to understand the intentions of the aircraft, or yeah. do they just have to vector traffic kind of away from that aircraft's heading? So as I recall, and I'm trying to remember the details of it, um, it squawks 7700, so it squawks an emergency code. So air traffic control knows the airplane has an emergency. And by the way, the, the procedures are for air traffic, they will vector every, so whenever that happens, they, they clear the air, airspace in whatever direction the airplane's going. Because okay? you can have um, that. And then, um, then it broadcasts in, I can't remember, it may, know the, uh, it may know the air traffic frequencies. I know it broadcasts on, one tw on, the, on the common frequencies, um, and probably 121.5, that the airplane is an emergency and it is diverting. And I don't recall whether it actually then in the voice thing will say the airport it's diverting to. But what it literally does is it finds the closest airport and it will fly to that airport and fly an approach and land in that airport and stop, right? So, um, uh, and it was worked out, but like I say, it was, uh, it was a very interesting kind of non-standard product or, or project because it didn't fit the certification general rules, but argued got in, what was argued in into uh, you don't have to meet them because you're you're already in a in an emergency situation. So you don't have to make you don't have to meet the standard normal operations criteria. Yeah. Hi, uh, Professor. So I wanted. Oh, I lost some. Okay. Yeah. There. You yeah. So you mentioned uh, wing and ground effect vehicles. Yeah. So I was wondering what are the potential challenges with those kind of vehicles. Yeah. Um, so that airplane. Uh, uh, by the way, I, sh I, I I I'm embarrassed. I didn't. Uh, let me see. Find the picture of it. Um, uh, what's in here somewhere? Um, yeah, so, so the, this is the middle one here on the left. Okay, it's a wing and ground effect. This is a company region. Um, and, and what it does is by flying at low altitude, the, um, be, because basically you get a mirror image of the wing underneath, you get an increase in your lift to drag ratio. You get more lift for the same drag, okay? Right, so uh, you get more performance out of the airplane. So it actually takes off on a hydrofoil, okay? So you can see the hydrofoil on, on the bottom. So it's a seaplane, it lifts into a hydrofoil and then it pops uh, <clears throat> into the air. Um, the challenge with these are actually landing in high sea states, okay? So, so that you have to be able to take the loads and be able to fly. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the interesting thing here is um, the, the, these guys are trying, they may be too clever for their own good, but um, they're actually not certifying this as an airplane, they're certifying this as a hovercraft, okay? So it turns out if you're certifying as a hovercraft, there's some FAA regulations you don't have to meet, okay? So uh, to make it a little bit mo uh, more practical. But um, the reason why I scored it is better on sort of the overall performance is that you, you, because of the wing and ground effect, you can effectively carry more weight at less penalty. Okay, so it's a little bit more practical than some of the other battery airplanes. Uh, question, yeah. Um, you mentioned that safety was a primary concern in the application of um, highly automated aircraft. Yep. Can you speak to the impact of cybersecurity on the integration of this field? Sure, so there's a lot of people who, uh, there's a lot of people and normally they're cons cybersecurity consultants, okay. Who, who raise all kinds of cybersecurity problems for, for both commercial airplanes uh, and whatever. Um, uh, so, so I would say today's existing airplanes are pretty robust, okay? Um, the, the flight control systems are isolated from 
<clears throat> from the rest of the systems, there's all kinds of firewalls that are pretty hard to get to. And by the way, the input is, is done indir indirectly through a human, okay? So that's good. You do open up a vulnerability pathway when you start commanding the airplane from, from a remote site. So if you look again at the WISCON ops, they deal with that, okay, in terms of what the, uh, what the communication guarantee protocols and, and such are. So th there, is, there is obviously a potential concern that you might hack it. That is, that is a known vulnerability. So in order to get approved by the FAA, you would then have to prove that you're robust to that, okay? So it's, it's a failure mode that you have to consider. So. Okay, and with that, I think we're out of time. Let's give Dr. Hansman another hand for a really engaging discussion of electric and automated aircraft.